Hi everyone, it is the Show Weekly Podcast and we are back doing the season finale for season two. We are wrapping up our summer festival, Show Britannia, where we've been looking at some really banging British films made by Film 4, BFI, uh, some old classic ones. We also had uh, some Ealing comedy last week. Um, I'm your host, Joe, and I'm joined by Ben and Charlie as usual. How's your week been, guys? Yeah, we lost the football. Yeah. That's pretty much it. <laughs> and Djokovic won Wimbledon. So Yeah. Ben, you were you were at Wimbledon this weekend, right? Oh shit, yeah, were you? I was, yeah. Nice. I was actually uh, watching Centre Court because uh, you know Money. Uh, yeah, money. Money yeah, problems. Yeah. And I wanted to keep some of my organs in my body. Didn't want to <laughs> sell them off. Um no, it was good fun. It was really nice. Um didn't rain. Uh we drove down. It took a while. Um, but it was uh, yeah. What it was day really did nice. you go? When uh, Saturday, so watched oh, some nice. of the some of the semi-finals. Um, yeah, it was a really good atmosphere. Um, a lot of food, a lot of strawberries and creams, and uh, that's the most Wimbledon thing you yeah. could eat. Yeah, a few glasses yeah. of Pims as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's got to yeah. be done. It's got to be done. <laughs> uh, of course, this episode was supposed to come out yesterday um but we are delaying it just until for, for a tuesday release just because it has been one hell of a weekend as ben said wimbledon uh we did have the euro final between italy and england Wait, bit of a tense what? one in my um what? did that happen i didn't i didn't realize that ah uh, <laughs> uh, it's just it's just denial mate it's just denial. yeah it's just denial um, it was a bit of a tense one in my house my my girlfriend is italian so um there were some tears, there were some tense moments, there was a little bit of heated, you know, that was a foul, it wasn't a foul, but it was all um, good fun in the end. Uh, and thankfully, we did manage to squeeze in a couple of films to talk about this week. One I'm very excited for, I gave it five stars straight away, really excited to talk about that. Um, but before we talk about this week's films, which are The Dig, Rocks and Quadrophenia, um charlie have you been watching anything else this week during this incredibly busy past week oh uh, well apart from sport uh, yeah i under ben's recommendation i did check out clarkson's farm honestly it i didn't know what to expect because i thought ben's just silent he's just yeah. in shock yeah he's in shock I'm just happy that, you know, I actually recommended something and <laughs> you guys actually, you know, when I watched it, incredible. Finally, yeah. <laughs> the idea of Jeremy Clarkson on a farm is was so strange to me that I just thought I've got to, I've got to see it. The so. idea of Ray Fiennes on a farm is weird, but here we are talking about the <laughs> <Yeah>. dig. <laughs> true. true. Um, uh, no, it's really good though. I'd like it's strangely like as you say, Ben wholesome. Like it's just mm. and the cinematography is fit. Yeah, as, so you, yeah, it's just so good. And is the it Amazon Prime, there. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Amazon, yeah, yeah, yeah. They they do just put all of their money into into Jeremy Clarkson and then any kind of show that he's in. <laughs> Great. Well, I, think it's, I think it's the same production team. So do you remember? Obviously, we had the whole uh, Clarkson and Top Gear drama like years ago. Now, I yeah. think yeah. I think some of the I think at the time I remember reading it's like the production crew that they had, or like like a part of the production crew came with it, like left the BBC with him and they went to work for. Um, the Grand Tour when they did the Amazon. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think it's the same team as well that did this. Uh, I think so. I mean, it certainly looks exactly the same. Um, it is brilliant. Yeah, it's just stunning. I mean, the farm itself is beautiful, and it just lends. To, it just really lends itself to the camera. Like it's very, <laughs> very. Photo- as if that's what he owns as well. Like as if. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my favorite scene is the start when he's just like, "Yep, so I own that bit over there." You see in the distance, and then. <laughs> yeah just points off in a direction at about three miles that way it's like wow. i love it it's it's so open that you can see like like weather formations just moving across the farm in like some mm. of the shots oh, that's incredible definitely worth a watch go go check it out absolutely, absolutely. it's not just uh testosterone in cars this time it's no no it's <laughs> testosterone in tractors in tractors yeah yeah have you also seen james may's cooking show as well i haven't but i that sounds amazing. That's also class. He's just there, just, you know, looking at a pan, just not knowing how to boil water and just being like, oh, toss. 
<laughs> no, you just can't cook. Uh, that's really good as well. Go watch What's that, that too. One? I think it must be Prime as well. Must be. Right, right, right. Uh, them lot are just, you know. Uh, Bumming off the Prime. Yeah, there we go. I wasn't going to say Give it, me but... money, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> <laughs> Bezos, please, boss. He's got enough of it. <laughs> oh, have you been watching Loki? Nope, no spoilers. Nope. Behind. Uh, behind. I'm guessing I have you have. Been, yeah, I have. Uh, it's the final episode this coming Wednesday. Uh, very exciting. Um, without going into any spoilers for for you guys, it, it I think it's one of the most successful shows uh, that they've done. I know they've only done three so far, but this really <laughs> it is the the icing on the cake. It really is. It uh, this show feels a lot more connected to Endgame than anything else. Because yeah, it, it literally leads straight yeah. from that moment in Endgame where Loki escapes with the Tesseract, and in doing so, he creates like he creates like a a branching oh, yeah. timeline, uh, and he gets picked up by this organization called the the Time Variance Authority, who are basically kind of like kind of like Marvel's Time Lords. A bit they, like the... in um, Umbrella Academy, like have you yeah. seen that? When they have like time police, don't they? Yes. Yeah, pretty much exactly yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah, and and they pick this Loki up and they start calling him. You know, he's a variant Loki. He's not like the real Loki. So they have to like you know get to the bottom of what what he did wrong to make the timeline split, which is obviously him taking the Tesseract. And um, it's a very it's a very good show. It kind of gives Loki a second chance. I know he kind of had a bit of redemption in 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 Thor Ragnarok, and then we saw him die in Infinity War, but. Um, this is a very different Loki. It's still that it's it's gone back to that classic, you know, arrogant, boastful Loki from the Avengers and Thor and Thor two. Uh, and uh, it's it's interesting to see the character change for the better in different ways this time around. So I know Marvel right. has a big issue of like cheating death, don't they? Uh, not really letting things die, but it's a great show, and um, I think it's going to lead into a lot of big things. Uh, Again, I'm not going to mention any spoilers for Ben's sake, mostly, but um, you know, I'm talking. They haven't released a trailer for Spider-Man Three yet, which is out in December. Like we've had nothing, no footage, no trailer, nothing for Doctor Strange, and with the whole kind of you know wibbly wobbly, timey wimey aspect of Loki, it wouldn't surprise me that events of Loki are going to lead straight into it. But then again, this is Marvel Phase Four, and every theory that we've had about Phase Four has just been completely flipped on its head because Phase Four is, you know, they're no longer adapting comic books. They're they're sort of um, they're the flipping. They're, yeah, they're 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 taking aspects from the comics and 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 completely flipping them around. So that's good. Though. Um, that's it good. is. Yeah, it keeps. They've it needed that. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Anyway. So. This week, uh, it is the final episode of season three. We're going to take a little break because oh, season two. <laughs> oh yeah, it is. See, oh, I'm getting <laughs> ahead, ahead of yourself. Myself, right? I? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's final episode. You know, I actually did that on a social post as well. I posted that, <laughs> yeah. that we were going to be doing the final episode of season three, and then an hour later, I saw it, and I was, oh, I need to change that. Um, Sorry, so no one saw it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All our fans saw it. Um, yeah, definitely. But yes, no, it is the final episode of season two. Uh, we have been, we kind of do these festivals now, I think, to sort of wrap up and, and to do like a nice theme every season. Uh, but we are going to be having a break, but we will be back at the start of August, maybe, you know, a week into August with some films. So if you do want to, uh, if you do want us to check out a film, you can leave it down in the comments below if you're watching or listening on YouTube or if you're on Spotify or anywhere that there's podcasts, uh, you can hop over to our socials. And you can leave uh, a film there, and we'll add it to the list for sure. I can't wait until the, the time someone does that and they recommend like a really, really shit film, and we just don't do it. It'll be bad. it'll be uh, Ben catfishing <laughs> and recommending that we look at Avatar again Avatar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> under an alt account. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we should, uh, you know, not to be blunt. I think we should get Quadrophenia out of the way because it was just not a great film, is it, Chaz? Why don't you start us off with Quadrophenia? Why did you put this on the list, man? I just don't like it. <laughs> Is that why you actually cool. put it on? Dude, can you can move on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just uh, think it's, it's a British film not done well, in my opinion. It just what? Why? Why do you not think it's done well? Uh, it's got an amazing cast in it, hasn't it? Yeah, and the soundtrack's mint. If you like yeah. the Who, yeah. um, I just think it's just a really quite bad story. It doesn't really work. Maybe it's like captures that time in history perfectly. 
yeah, as, as like a young rebellion in the sixties, but it just doesn't translate out of that time period very well. It would have been like doing a film now about Roadman, you know, like a Roadman. Yeah, 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 yeah. And imagine like, how cringe that'd be, like two I know. years down the road. Yeah, yeah. Because this was what nineteen seventy nine, like... and it was about um... the early sixties. Yeah, a bit later than that, wasn't it? Yeah. Like late sixties, and it? and it's just that's so contemporary. Nah. It's just like it? it's like yeah, it's like a roadman trying to make it in a gang in two thousand and five. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would just be really cringe. Um, yeah. Well, well I will say it's it, it. Some of the scenic shots are very nice, and it yeah, it's Brighton, which is pretty cool. Soundtrack's mint. Like, definitely go buy it or listen to it somewhere. I feel like there's like a lot of prerequisites to like being able to enjoy this film. It's like, okay, if you want to enjoy this film, you need to tick off two things. You need to be a mod head and yeah. you need to like the who. Yeah, definitely. And, like you, yeah. you need to know at least a little background about the history of mods and rockers to yeah. really understand it. And I, it's I niche. Think people yeah, people don't care. Like Yeah. As bluntly as it is, like it doesn't really do enough to set it up on its own. You do you do have to know your sixties knowledge, I suppose. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, by far my favorite film this week, uh, and one that we all messaged each other saying that we really enjoyed, was The Dig, uh, 2021, a Netflix film. And yeah, I I can't talk about this film enough, uh, and I keep thinking about it. But um, so The Dig, uh, if our listeners at home uh, managed to catch that one, really recommend it. Go catch it on Netflix right now. It is a fantastic British drama film directed by Simon Stone. It's based on a novel uh, about the true events of the 1939 excavation of Sutton Hoo, which is in Suffolk. And it's got Carrie, um, <laughs> good one. <laughs> <laughs> it stars uh, Carrie Mulligan, uh, Lily James, uh, Ben Chaplin, Voldemort, uh, <laughs> Ken Starr. <laughs> um, and yeah, it, it came out at the start of this year uh, on Netflix in January and just amazing oh, reviews. It fucking slaps, bro. It slaps. It, it really slaps. It, so essentially... But I don't know why. Like, because it's boring. <laughs> that's, it's that's a boring what, film, man. That's what we're going to get to the bottom of, <laughs> aren't we? That's what we're going to get to the bottom of. So um, yeah, Voldemort, Ray Fiennes, <laughs> he plays Basil Brown, who is this uh, working class excavator, lives in Suffolk, and he comes to meet this... Um, uh, this landowner called Edith Pretty, and who's played by Carrie Mulligan, and she's got loads of like big burial mounds on her rural estate in Woodbridge, and she offers him some money so he can uh, basically dig them up and just see if there's anything of interest. I think she's, you know, she bought that land with her husband. She's quite connected with it, and and she's also she also has an illness. She has like a very weak heart, and so I think before she um, bites the dust, she wants that kind of closure and she wants to know what's under the mounds and long story short they end up unearthing a anglo-saxon uh, like longboat uh that they believe was the burial site of of a great Ang- anglo-saxon king and it completely changed the understanding of the dark ages you know the dark ages were no longer dark and they discovered from this one excavation that the anglo-saxons that arrived in england were they had a coin based economy they had culture they they had art and they weren't just they 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 had basically evolved and and transcended the definition of of being you know these barbarians these brutes these cave dwellers and they they weren't they they were just as sophisticated and, and just as cultural and just as artistic as you know like the roman empire that came uh you know 600 years before them so it's a great film. It's a great history film. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, if you're interested in archaeology, it it's got that. But also on the flip side, it's a great film about mortality and life and death and time. And yeah, I, well, Chaz, what did you think of the film? I want to I want to hear someone else's thoughts about this because I can't talk. I can't stop talking about it. I think when I first watched it, I was just shocked at like how much it gripped me like i was like i was like oh i'll put it on like it's something to watch it's got lily james in it um (laughs) (laughs) uh, and i was but like i was sitting there and i was like wow this is actually like incredible and then you get Mm. towards the end and it's like you start to like cry a little bit and you're like why am i crying at some bloke digging up a boat like yeah it's (laughs) 
<laughs> in that in that sense, I think because it takes something so boring and makes it like emotional and interesting. It's very British. Yeah, we like that sort of crap, don't we? Where it's just nothing really happens, but you form connections with it. Yeah, I think there was a big risk that this film would become sentimental, um, and I think part of the charm is Ray Fine's performance. It, Ralph, you know, Ralph. Um, it's Rafe. It's it's pronounced Rafe. It's Serbian. Is go it? look it up. Yeah. Right. Okay. I want to look it up. Go go look it up. <laughs> Chaz, you're gonna edit this out. <laughs> no, I'm I'm keeping this in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yeah, Rafe Fines, uh, and his performance. He you know he's playing this. Um, like I said, this this working class excavator. He hasn't got a university degree. He hasn't got um any qualifications, and yet Basil Brown is so qualified to do this excavation. But a combination of his really rural Suffolk accent, which, by the way, does not get enough exposure in media, it, and his accent is phenomenal. Um, what I what I love about and what you said, Chaz, about you know English people finding clarity and and philosophy in the most boring of things, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, here we are. Just the whole film kind of feels centered around uh, Basil Brown's personality you know he's he doesn't talk unless he has to he's very calculated with his with his sentences and and his emotions and you know even when he finds that first piece of wood and it just crumbles like yeah. he, he doesn't get emotional and and the it's film doesn't stoic, do that it? at all yeah exactly and he's so um uh like not introverted what's the word like here he's uh he's very inward thinking but not in a not in an egotistical way and he's yeah he's just not very he doesn't he doesn't uh allow himself to get wrapped up in the world around him like he to him like the closest relationship he has is with the ground yeah with, I love with the, the earth and the bit when he's like oh, i can tell you where which farm each soil yeah. is from in suffolk or something mm. like as you say he hasn't he's not educated but he is like he knows his shit mm. <laughs> obviously the film tries to do like the typical drama stuff of you know the a big uh, the British Museum comes along and tries to tell Basil Brown that he's not going to be credited for this because he's not educated or he's not uh, qualified and which which is all true by the way and actually his his um, recognition as the film says at the end he he wasn't recognised until fairly recently but now he and uh, both he and Edith Pretty's names are now with the excavated you know the treasure that is now at the British Museum. So yeah, I, I actually I was shocked because I, I remember I've seen that uh, I've seen those items I've seen those artifacts like so many times when I've been to the museum, and I and, and throughout watching the film I didn't connect that it was that famous helmet you know right yeah yeah um, so when I looked it up on Google afterwards after watching the film I was I was like wow that's <laughs> I, I had no idea it's um, good um, you know the the museum coming in and taking control of that because as you say it is like a generic sort of drama trope. Yeah, but it doesn't feel like that doesn't take over the plot. I don't think. It, yeah, no, it, it, just it doesn't. Sort of happens, and you're like, okay, that's that's fine. And... Again, it just it's just it's just about Basil, isn't it? It's just it yeah, stays yeah, exactly. so close to him. Um, Ben, what did you think of the film? You, you messaged this afternoon saying that you really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I, was, I really enjoyed it. Um, it was it was fun. Um, you know, it had some kind of light-hearted moments that um it had some pretty serious ones you know with the doctor's appointments and the um you know some of the kind of interactions between the characters it was really good um i quite i quite liked i think one of the reasons why for me it was like you say charlie it was like it was almost like a boring film but it wasn't like it just kind of kept you going um it was just the different like it just had you know kind of five or six storylines and kind of themes running through it at the same time obviously there was the whole pre-war you know it was 1939 that's kind of like a bit of a subcontext um for the whole film which was it was quite interesting obviously we had the scene where the pilot lands in the river and they try and get him out and you know you've kind of got the the cousin um who was you know going off to join the RAF and that was kind of a bit of a ticking time bomb throughout the film and you wondered when he'd go and when he wouldn't go and stuff so I, th- I quite like that. Um, there's lots of different storylines, and it kind of just kept you, you know, each scene was kind of 
you know, it flicked through a couple of different characters. There was always, it wasn't really about the one main timeline, like the one main storyline. You know, there was kind of they were all interwoven really nicely, kept you in, engaged with it. Uh, there wasn't any kind of unnecessary scenes. Like everything was kind of there for a purpose, and you got a little glimpse of each character and how it, they like contributed into the whole. You know, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was a great film, um, and it's it's nice to have such a good film as well. Um, like you know now now that kind of COVID's looking in the rear, rear view mirror, especially for film production. You know, we're not really we hope. yeah we hope for now you know it's actually good that, that we've actually got a decent film um mm. and it's been released and it's been made well and you know it's actually been released which i suppose is for netflix they don't need a cinema do they they don't need a yeah. box office audience they can just release it um i'm so yeah. surprised that it didn't get uh nominated for an academy award yeah i feel At like least, it's one of, those, know, one of those films now that'll just like the die away though like no, no one's going to search for that are they on netflix yeah no it's a shame because so. i think people you need to it's, it's good mm. yeah also the editing as well really blew me away there were so many moments in the film where um there was a character talking uh in a completely different scene and yet the camera would linger on the scene that was closing yes yeah yeah yes, did that a lot didn't it? yeah it did it a lot and um uh, I remember me and my girlfriend watching it together and, and she was saying it, it, it started to not irritate her, but she was starting to notice it a lot. And she was like, it's so strange. It's so it's so odd. And and I think immediately I figured out why the why it was trying to do that. And I think it was trying to show that people and moments and memories, are, you know, if you make an impact in someone's life, it's, it's going to linger. Mm. And your your memory of that person is going to linger. Whereas the physical, you know, the 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 sound of their voice, or you know, even even something like a film camera, the film camera may linger, but the the story goes on. Uh, and I I found the editing, uh, which is which is quite rare for a film. It's usually the cinematography or the script that does a lot of the talking. But when you get a film where the editing does a lot of the talking, quite refreshing. It's really refreshing, and sometimes it could be jarring, but. It really wasn't in this case. It the, those moments where the like er, like there wasn't an an ounce of sound in the film, and it would just be the camera lingering on uh, lingering on 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 someone, and then all of a sudden the next scene would start, but audio only. Yeah, yeah. And I, I get it. We go back to that classic argument, not argument, that classic conversation that we always have on this podcast about you know. The film gives us uh, two plus two instead of four, and it's like it's kind of like we're searching for memories of these people because you know uh, you're introduced to a lot of characters, and when the film does that, when it lingers on Basil, for example, and then all of a sudden you hear Edith's voice over him in a completely different setting, like you can hear her like cutting her vegetables on her plate, having dinner, but you can't see it yet. Your your brain has to try and figure out who's talking, and and it's kind of like you're searching for memories that aren't yours. Because I think the point of this film is that, like I said, it, it's it's memory and time and and mortality, and that you know the people that we love and the things that we own, you know, people that we love will die, and we will die as well, and 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 but our memories will live on, and then hopefully our possessions and the thing that's, things that we leave behind, they're going to be here long after our descendants are gone as well. And it just really puts into into perspective just how, kind of like Basil, the whole world moves slowly and is constant and calculated, just like he is. Uh, I think and um, some of the sports that is, I can't remember the film have much of a soundtrack. Like, um, what was yeah. that film we did that didn't have one as well? No Country uh, for Old Men. That was it, yeah, yeah. So yeah. It feels a bit like that, but even the cinematography is like... That's a yeah. similar sort of landscape. It puts a focus on the landscape rather than characters most of the time, mm. which is nice. It's refreshing. I, I I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, and it's, it's, what's it like from a history perspective, Ben? Is it nice to have that sort of unknown area? Oh, of the kind of the Anglo-Saxon. Yeah, like the discovery of 
the yeah, dark I ages think, not being dark i suppose i think yeah i think so obviously for you know for us today and uh, well I'll say us loosely i mean for those that are interested in that period of history you know we know quite a lot we know so much more we do than now than we do that they would have known you know so for them you know it, it shows it in the film the 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 guy from the british museum is like you know when when basil goes up to him and says this i found a coin and this without doubt dates it as when I thought it was, which was Anglo-Saxon as opposed to Viking. Now the difference between Anglo-Saxon and Viking for this style, um, so for this kind of boat style and stuff, is is about three hundred years. So it's it's huge, three to two hundred years. So it's it's a huge like time jump. And for them, it was just like they didn't know anything about the Anglo-Saxons like really at the start. Uh, and you know, for them, it was just oh, they're just kind of the Dark Ages. There's this bit, this big black box of mystery and it you know you kind of they, i think they really transferred like transferred the emotion of that really well where they were just like oh my god <laughs> it's sixth century it's like it's so early um it's we don't know... like insane to actually like exactly experience yeah. it and know that for the first time like... yeah crazy I and mean, you know we kind of take it for granted you know today we're just like oh yeah we know about that like you know like we, we that know happened it... yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, we, we know that that's what it looks like we know that's the history of that period but for them it was just like we didn't know and now we do and that's really cool um you know and it's, they do you know some of the pieces that they dig out of the ground are like you know some they do match up to some of the some of the hoard um i didn't remember seeing the helmet though which was i was did was that in there did i miss that i can't remember either because that's the most famous bit from it isn't it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Was it, was I think it it's there? a. I think it's a recreation of the the helmet really it's more like the, the they found bits and pieces didn't they uh yeah yeah they they, yeah. they I did yeah but they didn't just like lift it out yeah anyway yeah no 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 yeah no they didn't yeah so I think that would have uh, been really like obnoxious if they just start lifting up a, like a helmet yeah, yeah. I don't know, I think you know, it would take me out of it but yeah, yeah so yeah. it was it was really good um in terms of you know like kind of uh, just it wasn't necessarily about you know the ang like them being uh, you know it wasn't really the focus wasn't on Anglo-Saxon history but it was just more a case I think it was their emotions at that time um of, of just discovering this new you know the, the new piece of history um which yeah it's just it's really cool um and you get you know like you said charlie you kind of get that emotional roller coaster at the end of the film of the kind of the highs of that and the highs of the yeah there's like the joy um and you know it's it's kind of you know like you said uh, joe this is quite a large two plus two moment where we they're in the car and then we kind of get like a, like almost like a the way it was edited, we almost kind of get to see a few of the conversations leading up to that moment. Mm. Um, and it's like... At the know, party, you mean? The, the celebration? Yeah, what yeah. happens in the hearing, you know, in the inquest. Did, did, yeah. did you get to keep it or is the British Museum claimed it? And actually, you know, it was really... You get those emotions and then obviously, you know, we, we already talked about it, the, you know, the fact that she has the illness and the, the impending uh, war. Um, and there's a few. I, I I really loved actually how they handled that impending conflict. There was some people which were kind of, they were just very. Um, they didn't think about it. Like it wasn't part. It wasn't in their psyche to even think of it. It was just like yeah. They weren't focused on it. But then there was the other characters, like like just dotted throughout, who who kind of you know. I, I think it was really well done, and it's difficult to say like would it have been accurate or not. But like they almost you almost got a feeling of impending doom from them. Uh, and, and yeah, like, it never felt like a ticking time bomb or anything. Yeah, really. but, it never took over the film. It never. No, it didn't. But you just kind it's of. It's always just there, or, like exactly yeah. Yeah, like, away in the back. Exactly. Like Brexit. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> the, you know the 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 lions, the 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 driver and the um the cook. They were both. They were quite in tuned to it, and you kind of yeah. You almost kind of it just set your brain off thinking, well, well why were they involved? Like in the first world war, was you know how are they? You know that guy. He's maybe in his forties. Like he definitely would have, or fifties. He would have fought in World War One, kind of thing. You know, so it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I really liked how they kind of brought that and just mixed that element in, and then you just had the kind of Lily James's part, which was actually really good. Um, uh, and that just kind of was like the complete opposite. Is like she was just like she was looking for love and she was looking for romance, um, whilst still being an archaeologist in her own right and i think i think I, you've we got in the notes they kind of did her a bit dirty because she was actually quite a well-known archaeologist in her own yeah it's one point. of the most uh fictional parts of the film is um 
Lady Pretty's cousin isn't actually uh, a real person. That that was that was completely uh, fictional. So Rory, I think his name is in the film. Oh, Rory wow. Lomax. Yeah, he was completely fictional, but was written as this love interest for Lily James's Peggy Piggott. But in I real life, Peggy like was actually she was actually very um, well respected at that point. But she was an experienced archaeologist, and she studied at Cambridge and University of London, and uh, yeah, so um, there's there's a few historical inaccuracies, but I think they can be forgiven because I think this this uh, you know like like we've said many times already, the film doesn't try to be sentimental, uh, and I keep thinking of like other. I want, I want to keep comparing it to a war film, but it's not a war film. It's just set in the backdrop of a war film. But then yeah. when I think of any war film, it becomes so sentimental. I like think of the end of Dunkirk where they're reading out Winston Churchill's speech. And it's yeah. like, well, the war wasn't fought just by Churchill. It's fought by the men. And and also that isn't the end of it. Like, <laughs> by a yeah. long stretch, like, that, that film leaves you thinking, oh, they're safe and that's it. Yeah, the end yeah. Of Dunkirk, but... And, it, and it's like very it. yeah, it's very sentimental. Whereas, um, the, uh, whereas the dig, it, it's just life will go on. This war will happen. There's a moment where you know when they announce on the radio in the pub that you know Britain is now at war with Germany, and uh, the, the the professor from the museum of, of from the British Museum is just like, well, here we go again. And it's just yeah. it it felt so normal. Like I didn't feel. There, there was that kind of sense of impending doom, but I didn't, like I said, I didn't feel like there was a ticking time bomb going, time bomb going off for these characters. It would have been uh, easy for them to make that the focus of it, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, definitely. And, and um, I'm glad it didn't. Yeah, uh, and I think the way that they chose to handle the backdrop of the war was done so well. Like when, when the plane, when, when the pilot crashes into the river, whether he was just on some kind of practice flight or something that had gone wrong or he'd been shot down or whatever happened. The way he crashed into the river was just so poetic for the film because his body perished, but that plane will be there for hundreds of that and thousands of years in that river. Also, on that scene, I'm glad it would have been easy as well to to, make, to bring that character into it, or you know, and, and explain, as you say, was it a training mission? But we it never explained. It's just yeah, left for you to decide because I'm, the people wouldn't know. There, yeah, there, there are so many moments in the film, and I think I think I can speak for everyone here when I say Christopher Nolan could really learn a big lesson from this film. Is you don't need exposition to tell a really deep and interesting story. Like the story of of Basil is so like fundamentally unique, and I'm so invested in his story, and yet I wasn't I wasn't bothered at all when. When um when uh, Pretty asks Basil if he has any children, he goes, "Uh no, well I uh we uh no, and that's it, just no." And he's yeah, about yeah. to explain, and then he he doesn't, he just he don't no. need the reason, like, and that's enough for me. It's like yeah, this is this is someone's personal life, someone who actually was real and and lived a life, and and I think Ray Fiennes just. <laughs> It's I think it a says a lot. It says a lot without saying it as well, doesn't it? Mm, the fact that he absolutely. doesn't answer it says a lot, which is because it's a nice then it's moment. explained later on. You know the the chemistry he has between his wife. You can tell that they have a very sort of practical platonic marriage. Yes. You know, she, it's very old fashioned. You know, she cooks and cleans for him and everything, and and then he's out doing work, and and they don't hug or kiss, or you know, they don't even hold hands. It's just. She writes him letters while he's he's doing the dig and comes to check on him when she hasn't heard from him for a week and 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 that's it you know. But when when she comes to visit him, it's like he's like, oh, would you like to come in for like a tea or something, doesn't he? And she's like, oh, yeah. no, no, no. But they're like yeah. really, although it's, it like seems weird to be that platonic, I suppose. But it's they're really nice moments. There's a really sweet yeah. moment. And that's all we need to know about their yeah, marriage. Uh, exactly, and yeah. you know, we don't need a big speech from from basil to to pretty about oh yeah we didn't have children because you know uh i've always been into my work and and i knew that children would be a distraction and it's just, i just don't yeah. care i don't care we don't need a shakespeare monologue yeah like, exactly yeah. uh we don't need the old uh nolan razzle dazzle yeah <laughs> um 
Yeah, and for all of its inaccuracies, I say all, it wasn't that many. It was just mainly just in terms of character. Uh, oh, also Carrie Mulligan as well. I did write write it wrong in the notes here, but um, do you think she was too young for the role? Because the real yeah. Pretty was like 56, Edith Pretty. She was, she was actually uh, I, older than Basil in I real life. A, I think she did a very good job. I, I, I think the maybe the main thing that, they got conveyed from her was obviously her frailty in terms of you know she had her health you know she had her like you know her heart was so weak and she went from being kind of this vibrant energetic enthusiastic character at the start of the film to by the end using a, a walking stick sitting in the chair watching them do the dig for like a huge period of time and then at the end she's kind of got that 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 really really amazing scene where they're in the boat uh, at night and uh, her son is kind of telling a story while they're in the boat and almost like treating it like a kind of a play you know play i almost got me you know i was well i mean firstly like just to what to one side that was such a good performance from um, oh the kid oh my god yeah yeah Incredible. yeah In- like, absolutely amazing really good but you know she i think she just did a really good job of uh you know the pain, the grimaces, and the, the the way she was carrying herself. I, I, you know, for me, I think it was at the end of the day, it's a character. You know, she still was in the acceptable age bracket of yeah, she's a mother figure. You know, it wasn't like it was like it wasn't like you know a twenty year old playing a yeah, yeah, you know, a mother or anything. It was it made sense. I I thought she was a phenomenal, a phenomenal <laughs> performance, uh, and uh, yeah, I just really enjoyed it. So for me, I didn't have an issue with that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I thought she was fantastic. Definitely didn't break my immersion, her age. Yeah. So. Uh, Nicole Kidman was originally attached. I um, think she would have been good. Yeah, yeah. I think Karen Mulligan, it's, I, don't know, I can't mm. see anyone else in the role now. I think Gwyneth Paltrow, not it. Gwyneth Paltrow, what's her name? Um, who played Galadriel? Kate, Kate Blanchett was also oh, yeah. attached at some point as well, so I could see that ah. too. But um, yeah, I think uh, it's been a while since I've jumped on letterbox like 30 seconds after the credits are rolling and given a film five stars it's been a while yeah cool. um, high praise definitely. indeed yeah really really good and not overrated like usually when i give a film of five stars it's because i'm like oh well you know just uh, there was nothing wrong with it but with the dig there are things wrong with it obviously but i just i i just can't not give it five stars the way it made me feel i, uh, I think it's like there's a connection with it like as soon yeah. as it the credits rolled, I was like, "That it's like it hit something in me," and I'm like, "That's I love that." Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even, the, even the credit scene was great. It's just the, them kind of yep. like almost reversing the start of the film, putting the soil back in. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, wow, like, you know. It and was, again, it wasn't sentimental. It wasn't like, oh yeah, flash forward to 2020, and there's going to be yeah. like a kid in the yeah. British Museum looking at. You know, a picture of the real yeah. life Basil. Like, I hate no, it when, oh, when films are based on a true story and then they show that the picture of the real person at the end. Like, I get that that's honoring the real person, but we're watching like a film about someone who's real. We know, we know it's not the real person in the yeah. film, mate. Like, we don't need you to show us a black and white picture of who it was. Yeah, I don't, know. Uh, I don't so- mind that. I think it's 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 like like you said. I I prefer the fact that they they're kind of honouring like the the people that the true story. Uh, like I, yeah. I I think I think sometimes the most dangerous thing with film is if it, it edits the version of events that actually happened too much. Yeah, and I, I I like I do like that with kind of period piece not necessarily period pieces because it's so much further but like kind of a lot of the films from like the war films and the in from the late 90s where it actually the late the late 1900s where they, it kind of you know grounds you back into reality i do like that though that's so why yeah i will say that but yeah no I, I just that end scene was so not sentimental i think you're right yeah, but it was emotional and it kind of mm. it took you back to the start of the film they've come full circle they dug up the the dig they've taken out the, the artifacts and then and then they put it back in but and it's a job basil's just doing his job he doesn't yeah. you know and yes it was kind of nice it, it was nice for him to you know to see a little bit of emotion from him when it was there was a chance he was going to get some praise from the museum on some some credit but he didn't 
uh, which is kind of like a bit of a kick in the teeth at the end of the film. Like, you know, he wasn't recognized uh, a couple of years after that, you know, when the war was over and uh, the artifacts got put in the British Museum, he wasn't recognized. And that's kind of a kick in the teeth to read. But if you ignore that and you just look at the, the, the shot of them, you know, putting the dirt back into the ground, I think that just, I think that almost sums up what Basil perhaps would have thought about it as well. You know, just he's doing a job. He's here to do a job. He's not here for praise or glory. He's, you know, the the fact that he carries on with the job after the artifacts have been dug up and taken to the museum, and he's like still life, getting, yeah. Life doesn't end because you haven't got recognition. Which is yeah, like yeah. It, it really shows that, doesn't it? Yeah, and I and I think like the way he was throwing the dirt into the ground and filling the hole in it, it it again it just really speaks to me about the shortness of life and you know we're not going to be here forever and 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 it's this the people and the memories that that linger and hopefully some artifacts you know well, i'll leave behind my podcast mike <laughs> and <laughs> we'll, we'll bury it in a long boat for you thanks mate yeah Cheers. yeah <laughs> Bury me in an inflatable canoe with a we will, <laughs> with my uh, podcast yeah. mic. <laughs> we will put a load of rocks around it. Way, segue, hey. segue. <laughs> yeah, final film of the festival. Um, yeah, Rocks 2019. It was at the 74th British Academy Film Awards and yeah. seven nominations actually tied with Nomadland for most of the, the most of the ceremony. So congratulations to Rocks. Very independent film. I think it's film four, isn't it? Yeah, and um, BFI, was it? Yeah. Uh, Chaz, why don't you give us a, a little bit of a breakdown of Rocks? Yeah, it basically follows a, a girl, a teenage girl called Rocks, who, after her mother leaves because she's uh, like mentally unstable and feels like she isn't fit to look after her children anymore, she has to mm-hmm. look after her brother and get, her, get them through their life, I suppose, really, and the best yeah. she can with what little resources she has. And it rips your heart out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've written here in the notes, uh, again, to talk about poverty porn films, because uh, we, we did that two weeks ago with, with Daniel Blake. <laughs> we do that every week, I think, don't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems to be a recurring theme. But I wrote actually here that um, this film has made me want to reevaluate that phrase, that that genre, like the name. Um, mm. Because to me, like, Rocks is it's com- it's completely naked and raw. Like this isn't, yeah. it's not glorifying. It's like in, similar to the dig. It's not sentimental. This is just young people. And even though at the start of the, uh, of the podcast, we talked about Quadrophini and it's not that great, but I imagine that, you know, with rocks just being that this film about normal young people living in London in 40 years, it might be looked at in the same way as, as Quadrophini you know, that with that yeah. kind of nostalgia and, um, I think it, it'll be, maybe not understood in the right context, like Quadrophenia as well. Yeah. Like, it'll yeah. be very dependent on knowledge of our time now. Like, Yeah. Um, Wikipedia uh, says that the subtitles are essential for rocks. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> as there is, uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't need subtitles at all. No, um, I didn't either. No. My, but, dad, uh, my dad didn't know some of the slang, I must admit. Yeah. But, he was yeah. like, what's peng? And I was like, hey, you, dad, you, you're the <laughs> <laughs> It's like you said, though, that like that the, the, the prior knowledge. So, like, but not, by knowing the the slang, you, it makes the film, it, like, it keeps it going, doesn't it? it keep, you, yeah, you're true. Held, you're held under in the immersion of it, like, and the, rea- the reality of it, like, you understand it fully. Um, it definitely feels more natural. Yeah. But, like, having that knowledge, definitely, yeah. I think uh, if I'd watched this film, say, five years ago, well, maybe maybe more so like six or seven years ago when I was still living in a very white countryside town, I think I would have struggled to relate to rocks in, in any kind of way just because, I, you know, you don't see that kind of poverty in the countryside. But I've been yeah. living in Birmingham for a couple of years now, and um, it, it's, it's such a really naturalistic depiction of, of um, like ethnic minority communities. And it, it's really accessible to anyone of any background, really. And I think, like I, Daniel Blake, we can relate to it on so many levels. Like, we all know people who have to go above and beyond to care for the ones that they love. And the film's not trying to be anything other than that. 
Yeah. Uh, apart from just one hell of a performance as well uh, for the yeah, actress. Didn't, didn't she win the BAFTA? The, yeah, I for Rising she, Star, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, I think she, yeah. Yeah, so he's she congratulations deserves, like, there. Yeah. Fully deserved. Um, that whole um, group of friends that are really well acted, like, I don't know if they're, like, had known each other before it, but the way they act is so, like, real. Like, yeah. I believed that they were all friends. Like, there's well, a few I, scenes. I think, uh, yeah, I think that, I think that is uh, slightly true. I think the, the director, Sarah Gavron, she, well, first of all, I mean, the crew consisted of, like, 75% women. Uh, wow. And not only that, but it was also like non-professional actors from like the local area. It was filmed in Hackney. It's a film about Hackney in London. Um, and it's like Stockport. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a film about Hackney in Hackney. <laughs> Hackney. Filmed in Hackney. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was uh, from what I've read on Wikipedia and, and IMDb. It's non-professional actors from the local area. So you might be right there. It, it could have been a group of of girl mates. You know that. Uh, just the chemistry was just electric. Yeah, the scenes yeah. where they're like just hanging out and messing around with the phone, and you can just you just know that they like that's what they do. Like if they're just gonna hang out, that's that's them just being filmed yeah. while they're hanging out. It's amazing. And I think that speaks well for the style of cinematography that the film goes for. It's kind of like that guerrilla documentary style. Almost. Yeah, it, um, my dad said like it's like it's all been filmed on a phone. Like yeah. it feels like that. Like, it's like the director has just said, "Oh, kids, you know, you just chill out, scroll on TikTok, uh, have yeah. a chat, and I'm just going to film you." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's uh it's great. It's 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 a great film. It's multifaceted. It, it's it its resonance is just really universal. And um, like I said, you know, I, I feel like I can relate to it living in such a multicultural city now. I, uh, and it's a it's a great film about immigrant families and coming of age of course coming of age with you know it's, <laughs> yeah with me of course it is yeah. yeah um it's about lots of things but it doesn't ever become overwhelming you know it's it's about yeah it's about being an immigrant it's about being black it's about being a girl it's about mental health it's about family it's uh it's not the fast and furious but it's about family <laughs> uh, <laughs> um it's about the working class you know it's urban it's london yeah it's, it's did you know where john cena was in it Oh, I couldn't see him. You couldn't see him, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, do, do go and check out Rocks. It is on Netflix as well. Quite an easy week, actually, on the streaming services. If, if you've got Netflix, you can watch two out of three. Um, where was Quadrophenia? I, I didn't watch it legally. Uh -huh. it, yeah. it was on um, Criterion, I think. Uh, is... Well, you would be the kind of person to have a subscription to Criterion. Never yeah. heard of it yeah. before, so. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there we go. Well, I think that just about wraps up Shoal Britannia. Um, what's the thoughts on the festival? I, th I think um, it's been really good films, but I, I feel like this one's been... It's been hard films, like hard-hitting ones, more so yeah, than I'd, last I'd, time. It's very quite depressing. I should have put a few more yeah. comedies in there. It's my, that's my Maybe bad. Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we'll calling that a trilogy. Yeah. Monty Python, yeah. We'll do a British comedy one. How about that sometime? Yeah, that, that, sounds, good. that yeah. sounds good. Um, well, chaps, it has been a pleasure. We are going to have a, a couple of weeks break now. I think very well needed. Uh, we're coming up to summer. Well, it is summer, but, you know, getting into uh, proper summer activities now. So, yeah, we are going to take a few weeks off and have a bit of a break. But uh, thanks for listening. Do be sure to follow our socials for updates and news. We will carry on tweeting and posting things during our break. So we're not going to go completely radio silent. So do hit that notification bell and drop us a like or a follow. We do appreciate your support and we will be back for season three. We're going to get some really good films and TV shows to break down and talk about and shred to pieces if it's one of Ben's suggestions. Uh, if it's and, Amazon. yeah <laughs> um, so yeah uh, like I said at the start do pop a comment in any of our socials or in the YouTube comment section and we'll get it on the list and please yep. I really want to do a, a recommended one from a fan I think that would be yeah, sick yeah I think that would be great I, th I think um, we always sit around having a chat about what we're going to do and it's always either something we've seen or if it's a festival and it's a lot of films to get through um, a lot of the time it's the unknown and we don't know what we're getting into so I like that. It's exciting. And I definitely wouldn't have watched The Dig if it weren't for someone else recommending it. So yeah, pop the recommendations down below or on one of our socials, please. And 
we will be sure to get it on the list for season three. But until then, uh, thanks for listening. Have a great July, and we will be back sometime at the start of April for season three. I'm your host, Joe. <laughs> Uh, April, yeah, April, we're having a whole year God. off like <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna do that bit again. Nice. Fuck's sake, man. <laughs> oh, no, leave it. That's cool. <sighs> so yeah, enjoy the rest of July. We will be back at some point at the start of August. Uh, but until then, this has been your host Joe, joined by Ben and Charlie for the Show Weekly podcast. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. <laughs>